Thank you very much for coming along. Another um, counter hegemonic chat. And today we have Mr. Leith Maruf and Ms. Dr. Marwa Osman in Beirut, uh, ready to talk us through all of the drama and the political changes going on in poor Lebanon at the moment. Um, so I would like to start by asking perhaps Leith or Mawa, uh, either of you, if you want to jump in, just for a brief update on the port explosion to start with. Is there any, are there any updates? Uh, what is the current state of information on this? Please, Leith, again. Well, I mean, there is an investigation that's ongoing. Um, there's many people that have been uh, either arrested and or uh, called in by the investigators. That includes the uh, person in charge of the port, uh, the person in, in charge of the customs at the port, uh, people that are part of the intelligence uh, security apparatus that deals with the port. Um, and there's many others that have been called in for uh, to give their testimonies, and that includes people that have been in positions of power around the port uh, since the uh, supposed 12,750 tons of ammonium nitrate were imported into uh, the port in 2014. Um, <clears throat> also, at the same time, we've had a speech by uh, the Secretary General of uh, Hezbollah uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, where he uh, said that everybody that has been responsible for bringing this amount of uh, explosives into the port, whether this was an attack and or was just mismanagement, will be held responsible because in any case, just having this material in the port is a crime. Um, and that it's still open the question of uh, foreign interference in the explosion. Um, you know, this is the, the the brief update that I can give. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, can I ask you, Mawa, um, just to give us a brief update on the STL? Now, in, in, just for the background for our viewers, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon was an inquiry with significant outside intervention set up into the assassination of former Prime Minister Rafi Kariri 15 years ago, the tribunal being going for more than 10 years. Uh, it only targeted Syria and then Hezbollah. Could you give us a brief update on what that means and what it ha has meant for Lebanon and what the outcome has been? Well, 15 years later, uh, $1 billion later, 49% of which was paid by Lebanon, and uh, more than a grudge later, it's way more than a grudge later, uh, against Lebanese people among themselves, we find out that one person, one person, was mm. responsible of killing the most important political figure in the Middle East at that time, which uh, he had the biggest convoy, wherever he wants to go, he would have the biggest convoy around him all the time. So it was one person that was supposedly, whose name is Salim Ayash. We don't even know him. We don't know his mother's name. We don't know where his family is, where he lives. I don't know if he even exists or not. But the point is that all because of uh, phone calls, which is not even barely enough at that time to be considered, because at that time, uh, that that time was even before the 2008, uh, uh, the May uh, 7, 2008 uh, happenings or events in Lebanon where uh, Hezbollah went to the streets for the first time with its uh, soldiers uh, in the streets of Beirut to stop the Israeli influence by, with the hands of Lebanese politicians to try and infiltrate Hezbollah's communication network. So we're talking not in 2008, rather in 2005, when it was nearly impossible for any commander or any very important figure in Hezbollah to be having a mobile phone uh, along with him all the time. Mind you, during the 2006 war, if we would have someone affiliated with the resistance coming to visit the people or see them, they would ask other people to remove their mobile phones. We are talking about a group that does not trust anything that mm. is controlled by the West. So what the STL said that one human being out of eight who were supposedly suspects, four of whom are supposedly Hezbollah figures, one of them is also supposedly Salim Ayash, the other three were acquitted. So Salim Ayash made the phone calls with himself. He 
uh, got the van, which was uh, stolen from Japan, but ended up in Beirut, uh, which was used for the explosives. Uh, it was Salim Ayash who did all the intelligence work, who put the supposedly bomb in place. But no one is talking about all the cameras that were stolen from the area. We don't know where the security cameras of HSBC Bank, of uh, St. George Hotel, of Venetia Hotel, they were uh, vanished. No one is talking about the head of the intelligence back then, uh, who was, uh, by the way, who was later on assassinated uh, in Beirut as well, who happened to go MIA during that day, supposedly going to his university for an exam. The university says he never made it. Uh, he says his phone was turned off. He didn't know about the assassination. Investigations by the STL said that no, his phone was not turned off. On the contrary, he had more than two dozen phone calls made at the time of the assassination. And uh, his name is, um, if I'm not uh, wrong, um, I'm really bad with names, but um, what's his name like? Can you can remind me, the head of the uh, Hariri uh, intelligence? He was assassinated yeah. in Beirut. I, I, think, I think his name is... Uh, I remember it. I'll remember it throughout, definitely. Okay, but, now the, the uh, thing is, the, the, thing is the, the big narrative was this whole investigation was aimed only at Hezbollah. Uh, initially, at and the Syria. Syria. This they is gave, what up, they, they gave up on the Syria story. Yeah. And, and then don't, don't, don't forget and, that this was the, the step one to removing the uh, Syrian influence from Lebanon, including the presence of the Syrian Arab army who was there to uh, protect Lebanon from Lebanese uh, aggression, despite the fact that there were some sort of uh, unfortunate events that happened. We all know about them. Uh, even the Syrian uh, presidency spoke about yeah. that and acknowledged that there were some uh, problems right there. But it was a huge event in the Middle East. Fifteen years later, it turns out that a man that does not even exist who is supposedly affiliated to Hezbollah is uh, is to be blamed. Everyone is disappointed. Even I mean, look, even Hezbollah itself is disappointed that all this money went for nothing. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a question. So by the way. at least to have some sort of uh, of some sort of a surprise that would at least at least give some political uh, maneuver for the 14th of March, but it just blockaded uh, their we, political. Can maneuver. we just clarify for our for our listeners that? The report actually said there was no evidence, quote unquote, that the Hezbollah leadership or that the Syrians were involved. But we still have some media, unfortunately, one of the Chinese television saying Hezbollah members convicted. Can you clarify that? No, well, but I, I remember the name. His name is Wissam al Hassan, the head of the security uh, uh, intelligence a agency that was supposedly the head of uh, the intelligence group uh, guarding and safeguarding Rafiq Hariri is Wissam al Hassan, who was later on assassinated, who all uh, investigations done in Lebanon through uh, uh, in investigative journalism and uh, special Lebanese investigations show that this man was involved somehow with the assassination. But when we see headlines, even uh, by friends, they're not really friends, but at least we are on the same side when it has to do with uh, 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 geopolitical issues in, in the region, especially in Western Asia. Uh, but when you see headlines like this, it's just a matter of people not understanding the they Lebanese They don't read past the headlines, well. that's the problem. Yes, they yeah. just wait for Reuters or AP to write about something that's very delicate yeah. and really, really complicated inside Lebanon, and they, they just report about it. And I yeah. doubt that I've ever seen any real Chinese or Russian reporter on the streets of Beirut trying to find out what really happened. Yeah. They don't really go the that point far. Is, they just the point is the leadership's not involved. But I do remember from that case, like uh, many years ago, I think 10 years ago now, there was some uh, evidence that was put forward or some possible evidence that was put forward by the Lebanese resistance Hezbollah. And I'm just curious, uh, was any of that investigated? Did they, did they, was it even brought up as, as something that should be investigated? So there's there's m multiple things that we need to point out. Number one is that the court case, you know, this tribunal in its decision basically said that they don't know what is the, uh, you know, reason for this uh, assassination. So what is the motive? They don't know how the, who are the planners of the assassination. They don't know how, who is and how did they get the truck, the Mitsubishi truck that was stolen from Japan, sold, they don't know by who to who, in Tarablos in North Tripoli, in North uh, Lebanon. They don't know where the group that 
committed this assassination, got the explosive material. They don't know how they put it in the truck or when and where. Uh, they don't know. They have no evidence, video. So it seems, video. Like a, seems like an investigation that works back from the conclusion. So the conclusion is that it must have been Hezbollah linked. And then they, then they say, well, what kind of evidence can we find to link it to this organization? And and yeah, I mean, they spent a billion dollars of it, and uh, that's the Lebanese people's money, unfortunately. But, you know, despite that, they didn't even take into consideration the evidence presented by Hezbollah, which was very, very important evidence, given the fact that there was even uh, a week, weeks before the assassination, and especially during the day of the assassination, Israeli reconnaissance uh, drones all over the place, even uh, fighter jets uh, flying at, uh, uh, at uh, low altitudes, especially in that area. They even mm -hmm. got the images that were taken by this reconnaissance drone. The, uh, the uh, resistance was able to to infiltrate the, the images, bring them and give them as evidence, yet no one even had the, yeah, the, the audacity to even ask the question. They yeah. related to this Because the, the obvious are, thing that you do then yeah. is to say to the Israelis, like, you know, is this, is this true? Did you have your planes here? At what time Nothing. were these planes? But none of those this questions is, were asked. This is very important, the issue of the surveillance footage from the drones, the Israeli drones, during and uh, before the, the assassination. Because at the time, uh, Sayyid Hazrat Nasrallah actually breached the security of Hezbollah by presenting the world with evidence that they can actually infiltrate the yeah. drones, Israeli drones, and capture their footage. Like I a mean, game of poker, he's like, here are my cards, you know, yeah. stop pointing the finger at us. Yes, yeah. so this is this is one thing. The other thing is that there was a uh, Wahhabi, you know, death squad leader. His name is Abu Adas. Mm -hmm. uh, he was, uh, you know, he, uh, he sent uh, an interview to Al Jazeera television uh, and other media the weeks uh, after the assassination, admitting that they were responsible for the assassination. And actually, this evidence, uh, Abu Adas, you know, who, who was involved in, um, in um, you know, up, uprising, let's call them, whatever you want to call them, in north, in Tarablos, in Nahr al-Barid, uh, refugee camp, Palestinian refugee camp, and the group of Abu Adas, they were never investigated and they disappeared. Mm. They even knows where Abu Adas is. Okay? And, and, and so they <clears throat> had to ignore even the, the actual confession of this Wahhabi Contra uh, and their leader of the assassination to come yeah. to this conclusion that uh, a, uh, by the way, uh, uh, the person that they accused finally of this as, uh, assassination that uh, you know, as Marwa presented, uh, he is not known to be a member of Hezbollah, and actually is a, is just a firefighter. You know, this is what mm. his his day job is. Um, so. This is and yeah. it reminds you that the, the, the Abu Adas Contra and the group that was involved in 2008 later on uh, with the devastation that happened in Nahr al-Barid, uh, they are, uh, his group now are under the command of Ashraf Rifi who came after the assassination of uh, Wissam al-Hassan and took his position. So Wissam al-Hassan who went MIA during the assassination of Rafi al-Hariri was assassinated years later and Ashraf Rifi became in his position officially and now Ashraf Rifi is actually the real commander of these contras in uh, North uh, uh, Lebanon which are now being supported and funded by Turkey as well. So it's all one big complex movie if you will but if you connect the dots it, it's it's clearer than and it's crystal clear. So it just needs a little bit of more digging but apparently they're not allowed to do that. This is what the evidence mm. points out. They were only allowed to say that look no Hezbollah we don't have any evidence against Hezbollah. It's not that we clear Can we just clarify one thing? Evidence. This is one thing for Tim the, wants to for clarify. The that the um, the people you're talking about, and not everyone may be aware of it, but these are in effect the predecessors of Jabhat al-Nusra, which is created yeah. to carry out terrorist acts in Syria and in Lebanon too. So yeah. people shouldn't lose sight of the fact that these people have capability of carrying out atrocities. Has anyone been making the link, by the way, between you know the later events? I suppose we, we shouldn't exclude the, the Saudi kidnapping of uh, 
uh, Rafi Kariri, some yeah, later on, but also the people that were involved in terrorism in Syria and Lebanon. Anyone make those Look, links? It's, it's very much politicized. When, when uh, a group of uh, uh, investigative journalists try to open this up, one of the uh, uh, one of the people who were actually uh, went through an attempted assassination, who later on became Minister of Culture in Lebanon, Maisha Dia, uh, she herself denied the fact that there would be any responsibility for the uh, international agencies in Lebanon presented by Wissam Al Hassan and Ashraf Rifi later on. She said, Why are you asking these questions? I mean, are you out of this world? Who are we supposed to ask? Mm. If these people run the intelligence agencies in Lebanon, yep. who should know, who should have an idea who these groups are, who Abu Adas is, yep. where his uh, uh, that nation came from, where his weapons came from? We don't even know, we don't even have answers as to what happened in Nahr al-Barid and where these people went well, later on. I think, I think what that says is that, you know, whenever you hear international uh, tribunal, don't think it's going to be better uh, because there's always interests involved. There's always the interests of foreign powers. Um, which brings me to something that I wanted to talk about. So Lebanese political economy, the, the 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 situation on the ground with the with the political system. There's been a change in government. Um, so the prime minister, the former prime minister Hassan Diab, has resigned, and uh, this is in the backdrop of a of a conflict that a lot of people I don't think uh, realize was happening, which is that you had the central bank governor on the one hand, Riyad Salame. And obviously, there's a lot of anger against him. There would be, given the fact that something like 30 to 50 billion dollars in capital flight has left the country over the past year. But I think there's uh, a lot of people don't know that Hassan Diab actually was trying to mitigate the situation somewhat. He was against paying back the debt. So, do you think there's uh, there's there was another interest here behind getting rid of Hassan Diab, or what, how do you what's your read on the situation? Well, um, uh, I should have. Yeah, let, I'll give it to Leif and then I'll give it to Marwa. I should have. <laughs> no worries. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, <clears throat> the situation in Lebanon is not that complicated. Yeah. You know, you have a resistance movement who expelled the occupier in 2000 and had a choice of taking over the government uh, and, you know, eliminating liquidating all those who are collaborators which would have required a bloodbath mm. uh, and decided that it's not going to do that that it's going to try to mitigate the effect of the collaborators and slowly but surely create a sovereignist government so 20 years it was a long long-term plan and long-term process in 20 years they managed to bring in uh, a president from the Christian uh, uh, sects here in Lebanon that is uh, Michel Aoun. Exactly, Michel Aoun that is you know patriotic, even if he's critical of Syria or not, but he's he's a sovereignist. Uh, and uh, you know this last uh, demonstrations that brought in the Yab was the first ever Sunni prime minister that is not associated with the imperialist collaborators, right? Mm, and interesting. What was come next was a a purge of the army, which is infiltrated, the security forces, which are infiltrated, the economic structures, which are infiltrated, and that would also require a slow process. Now, you know, the, the setback of the resignation of the Yab, uh, you know, in, in the long term, this explosion that happened in the port, uh, you know, highlighted more and more so how the security forces and the army are infiltrated and may actually play better to the hands of the uh, resistance. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure how much patience there is in the Lebanese population, but honestly, I, I don't well, see another other way. Yeah. That's what I've seen because, um, you know, a lot of the criticisms that I've seen from people who support the resistance is that Hezbollah hasn't been interventionist enough, that they've been too hands off, that they haven't tried to use their position to advance more of a social agenda on, on the economic front as well in order to look after issues like inequality. Rather, they've chosen to work alongside, you know, uh, 
a system that has some corrupt elements. I mean, I'll, but then you know, that then that's that's the, that's where the, I, I think have, there's I been have, some. I'm 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 one of the people who act. Yep. Oh. We lost you, Mawa. We lost you. Okay, maybe we can go back to Leith. Maybe you can. <laughs> you want to follow on from that, Leith? Yeah. So, so I mean, one of the threats that the app made a couple of weeks before the explosion uh, was that you know he he pointed the finger directly at uh, Salami, uh, general manager of the central bank who's basically the U.S.'s man, uh, the, the actual person in charge of the economy and in control of the finances of the country and who, you know, basically helped the theft that happened and the Hello. flight of that yeah. happened. You completely oh, hey, Marwa, sorry about that. We, we lost you there, but we're I in the middle of... Um, yeah, so late. Uh, I, uh, the screen froze. I'm sorry for that. We'll let Leif no, okay. finish his answer okay. and we'll come back so to you. So we'll let Leif finish and then we'll, yeah, we'll move please, it on to you. So definitely, uh, you know, uh, Diab threatened and pointed the finger at Salami. He also threatened the Banks Association. And the change was coming, you know, if, if there was, if the explosion didn't happen and now, you know, we're opening into, into the unknown here of, of what the, the creator would know, the future that could have been, you know, most probably Salami was going to be, you know, removed from office. Now we're back to the step of trying to negotiate a, a prime minister in position. Uh, and how is that going to affect any uh, cleanup or purge within the uh, financial and security systems of the country? Okay, um, to you, Marwa. You were about to well, say uh, before you were interrupted. I was, I was saying that I, I for one, was uh, one of the people who criticized the Hezbollah role of staying aside in this economic disaster in Lebanon. But let me ask, let, let us think about what happened after the liberation of Lebanon in the year 2000. Hezbollah was not and Hezbollah decided not to even go after the people who threatened its existence. Mm, the people mm. who collaborated with Israel to kill its commanders. The people who collaborated with every foreign power to make sure that Hezbollah disappears, especially in 2006. We literally were bombed, were carpet bombed in 2006. And yet Hezbollah again sat on the table with all his foes, political foes in Lebanon and started a dialogue. This is a very important foundation of what Hezbollah is about in this region. They don't want the responsibility to be all borne by Hezbollah, especially after 32 years of corruption, but at the same time, they know that they are very well, uh, maybe appreciated and respected by a large number of Lebanese, that the Lebanese look up to them for savory. They want to be saved and salvaged. Uh, so they want salvation from the disaster, the political disaster and the economic disaster in, in Lebanon. I understand their position, but it's people right now that the, the, the economic uh, situation is really bad to a point that even your saved money, you cannot even uh, get to your money. You're not allowed to withdraw your money, which means you are left without anything. You are left with just uh, breadcrumbs and you can only uh withdraw them in lebanese lira which has lost more than 89 percent of its value throughout mm. less than a year now so it's disastrous it's not like before people uh people were very yeah. very uh, uh, uh devastated by this added to the direct and indirect sanctions that uh, were uh, imposed on lebanon and syria because the caesar act affected very much the lebanese economy I mean, after that, they even stopped the people from receiving U.S. dollars coming from their uh, families abroad through uh, financial agencies like uh, OMT, MoneyGram, uh, Bob uh, Finance. These are very, very important financial agencies that don't go through uh, banks. They do go through the Lebanese uh, Central Bank, but you would get it. You, you would get paid. At least you would know that someone would be able to take care of you outside of Lebanon. But even that stopped. They only allowed this to happen again after the devastating August war explosion. They allowed people to get money in U.S. dollars again from uh, OMT, MoneyGram, etc. And they are allowed a bit more of fresh money to be collected from the banks. But again, you're collecting it. If it's fresh money, you can take only a certain amount per week. And if uh, it's if it's fresh money from within Lebanon, which means if I send my sister, for example, uh, let's say $200 
uh, from here and she wants to take it in South Lebanon, she's going to have to take it in Lebanese Lira at a very, very low, lower rate than the actual yeah. uh, rate in the market. So it's a devastating point. Hence why the people now are asking Hezbollah even further and with a higher voice to get involved. But what happened with Hassan Ajab was very interesting because the man was threatened with his own personal interests. You know, Hassan mm. Ajab was... Uh, uh, a deputy director of one of the uh, departments at the American University of Beirut okay. for uh, more than 25 years. And uh, he was threatened that all his pension money will not be given to him. Also, his uh, his uh, uh, wife as well, she's also a very prominent uh, lady who was also threatened with her own personal benefit. Add to that, that even within the government of Hassan Jab itself, we always heard, even before the explosion, that there are certain ministries who are either affiliated to Shumblat or to uh, Nabih Birri that were always threatening to uh, resign at some point. We heard that before the August 4 uh, explosion, and after the explosion, it was the first People who resigned were the people of Jumblat and Ibih Birri within the government of Hassan Ajab. And look at it, Hassan Ajab was not even uh, ready to, uh, uh, and he, was not, he was ready to call on those who are responsible, but he was not allowed. Why? Because just like the U.S. ambassador in Lebanon, Dorothy Shia, prevented Hassan Ajab from going after uh, Riyad Salemi, they also prevented him to a certain point from going after the people who are responsible for this disaster. Mind you, gotcha. if it were an attack or not, he was not allowed to get them. They were put under house. We don't have anything called house arrest in Lebanon. You either arrest someone or you don't. Just to, um, so, um, wanted to move on to the, the, the topic of, of future economic solutions for Lebanon. Two countries in particular come to mind. And uh, Laith, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Um, uh, you've got China and you've got Iran. Now, I look at the, the map and I think, well, these are countries that Lebanon would, Lebanon would have a natural affinity towards opening up trade relations with, and yet the political structure, the elites of Lebanon seem nonetheless to be tied to the former colonial power France and also the United States. Is there any consciousness among the Lebanese people that you've spoken to that this needs to change, that Lebanon needs to embrace multipolarity, or is there still a nostalgia for the old Western powers? Late and Well, look, yeah, look, I, I just want to be clear, you know, Lebanon has a, a population of four million citizens, you know, and another two million Syrians, Palestinians, Ethiopians, uh, and so forth. This is a city-state around the city of Beirut, okay? This is a country that can never be economically independent. You can have the delusion that you can be economically independent, but it's impossible. You know, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, something like Luxembourg, uh, do you know any product that like Luxembourg produces that is famous for and is independent on? No. Uh, Monaco, what is it? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, casino. you know, casino. That's what it is, right? So Lebanon, geographically has been purposefully chopped off from Syria mm -hmm. to make sure that it will always and forever be dependent on Western imperialism and colonialism to be able to pretend that it's sovereign, okay? So, uh, you know, the logical thing for Lebanon is to have the minimum, if not unity with Syria, and Iraq as, as one state, the minimum is to have economic unity, right? The Lebanese market uh, has to be integrated with the Syrian and the Iraqi uh, market, at least if we're not talking political integration. For it to start becoming, uh, to actually be able to compete and offer something to the rest of the world, right? So right now, Lebanon's borders with Syria are blockaded. Uh, the sanctions are, you know, targeting anybody and everybody that makes any business with Syria. Uh, and the port has been destroyed. It's the only way out of the world. So, uh, again, you know, we're put into this position, this country is put into this position with a choice. We have uh, a French aircraft carrier parked with, uh, you know, hundreds of mercenary French troops. Uh, a British nuclear submarine, another German, uh, you know, destroyer, mm. uh, American, gotcha. you know, 
whole fleet in the and they're being given a you know <laughs> I mean this is a stick standing right yeah. on top of you. I mean, and if you, you wanna, have to, if, in Lebanon, if you want to have a government that's willing to stand up to Western powers, then they have to be willing to die. <laughs> they have to be willing to stake their entire life, right? I mean, look, isn't that the, the, the... Yeah. Look, Jay, hence what happened with Rafi al-Hariri, because yeah. Rafi al-Hariri in these last couple of months was very on very good terms with the resistance and with Syria before he was assassinated, which is why this raises a lot of questions concerning now. Uh, but uh, to talk more about the, the economic uh, disaster in Lebanon, look, after the Ta'af Accord, after the end of the civil war in Lebanon, the hold of clashes, please, I believe the civil war never ended. But uh, mm -hmm. after the clashes were halted and the Ta'af Accord was signed, uh, there was um, a scheme uh, by bankers who are affiliated directly with the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. Central Bank that were uh, uh, imported to Beirut and given very high-ranking positions like Riyad Salemi and other also very important people uh, who control the financial situation in Lebanon. <laughs> Sorry for that. No, who control right. the financial situation in Lebanon. But what happened is after 2008, Lebanon's uh, oligarchic elite, if you will, they engineered... <laughs> so uh, I was saying after 2008, Lebanon's uh, uh, elite engineered uh, what is like a financial boom that fueled inequality and it just lined the pockets of bankers and now the the economy has imploded it, it's leaving the country's working class to foot uh, the entire bill and at the same time we had defaulting in march on our uh, sovereign debt for the international monetary fund which was bound to happen definitely because the economic model was fundamentally it was, it was fueled on, the on last debt on debt and consumption I mean, for the elites, basically. The bottom basically. 50 percent in Lebanon earn about the same as the top 0.1 percent in mm. the country, while the top 10 percent they take at home at least 60 60 percent of the the country's income. This is unbelievable, but this is what happened. Well, look, at the same time, uh, the crisis was definitely allowed by the uh, person of Riyadh Salemi, by the central bank itself. It accumulated foreign uh, reserves. The money flowed into the country. And then it was just, it left, just like you said, more than 30 mm. to $50 billion within less than a year. And it also means the economy was very much uh, vulnerable to any external shock, hence the sanctions that were imposed on Lebanon. Uh, and he's by, protected uh, by the Americans. Yes, Riyadh Salemi is protected. They put a ring around him and say, do not touch this yes. guy. He's our guy. Definitely. You could go online and research what the uh, uh, military governor in Lebanon, the U.S. ambassador, Dorothy Shia, said about this man. He said this is a red line. He is protected by uh, the Americans. He is entrusted by the international community. But hold on, Ms. Shia, who is the international community? I don't know. Hello. What? What are you doing so with our country? You're bringing our economy down to shatters and you're asking us to let go of those who are responsible of this. We know that our economy is more of a, a spending economy. We don't have uh, an uh, agricultural industry or an, uh, an actual uh, vi vital living economy, but we were able to fix it. You said we were very tiny to a point that if we get help from the right people, we will be able to fix it, but we are not allowed why? Because mm. we are the gateway to Syria and the gateway to Palestine. If we become sovereign enough, then definitely Israel is in big, big trouble. And as well, they're not be able, they will not be able to have a, a gateway to, to Syria to, to suffocate Syria even further. This is why they impose the Caesar sanctions. Even the businessmen who had uh, bank accounts in Lebanon, who are Syrian businessmen, are not now able to withdraw their money or do anything with it. You're not allowed to send out uh, letters of acceptance from, to, to receive letters of acceptance from banks abroad or to send money to banks abroad in able to, uh, to, to, that enables you to do uh, uh, B2B uh, business transactions. You're not allowed to have a transactions anymore. They want to suffocate us knowingly that 92% of the products in Lebanon are fully, uh, they are fully uh, yeah, imported. And this, and this puts a lot of the, the stuff about aid into more of a context because there is like a bit of an aid circus going on. And so a lot of people yeah. uh, genuinely believe that the West is trying to help Lebanon, but they don't see all of these other, under, these, these did, grimy did details. Did you hear the conference? Did you hear the friendship conference for Lebanon that was held 
uh, by uh, the well, French president. I, Manu 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 I, wanted to, I wanted to know about this because um, are there ultimatums? Do you feel like there are ultimatums being thrown at the Lebanese people where they say, give up this, give up this, betray the resistance? Um, basically, full-scale interference into Lebanon, Lebanon's affairs in exchange. There are, for there are aid. three very important issues. Three very important issues here. Let's begin with what Macron said when he came to Beirut. When he came to Beirut just a day after the explosion, or it was two days after the explosion, he sat with every political bloc in Lebanon, including Hezbollah, and he told them that, "Look, this is a political consensus plan. If you want to get on board, in a month from now, I'm be coming back, and I will hear your uh, end of this uh, agreement." Just less than a week later, he reneged on all the promises and all the plans he made because of the U.S. intervention. They wouldn't allow him to go with this plan. Second, you have the uh, battle ships, the warships that you spoke about there, that are now literally on our necks. If we do anything, they will kill us. Third, and which is very important, is what Macron said during the conference, which is the Friends of Lebanon conference. He literally said all the money that will be allocated to help Lebanon get out of this disaster will be given to the civil society. Who is the civil society in Lebanon? The NGOs who are funded, uh, which NGOs uh, mm. comply to which part of the Lebanese uh, constitution? Nothing. They're not even included in the constitution. There's no bill that would go and ask them where their money is from, wh who is helping them, who is funding them, oh, who is taking their so, yeah. for them. So we'll get an intervention from Laith, please. So just to say, um, you know, because everything that Marwa said is is correct, but at the same time we have to think about really, you know, these threats. What is their effect on Lebanon and or the resistance? Um, and I can tell you that the result, the, the these threats amount to zero, okay, to the resistance. And we can uh, take from the speech of uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah last week when he uh, mentioned the French uh, aircraft carrier that's parked right now in the port, and he waved with his hand and uh, told everybody, don't be afraid, don't be scared. It, it, it kind of, and, and this was on the anniversary of the end of the 2006 war, where Israel was defeated and their main destroyer was, was hit by uh, a Lebanese uh, resistance a missile and sank in, 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 in the waters here. It was an, uh, a clear indication that instead of these uh, you know warships being in our waters, instead of them being a threat, actually they are an opportunity. Targets that are soft and easy that have been provided by the imperialists. And I tell you for sure, that everybody from the United States and France and Germany and England probably shat their pants when they heard him, you know, referring to that. Okay, and so I, I think what the Israelis and the Saudis, who I think were behind both the assassination of Rafiq Hariri and this explosion that happened in this port, what they thought would have been an opportunity as a result of this explosion, to target and encircle uh, Hezbollah and the resistance and bring down the whole country and, and cre create a civil war. And then these <laughs> French helicopters supporting the, the killing of, of Hezbollah right now is an opportunity for the resistance. Because, uh, you know, the people that got hit from the explosion in the port are the upper and middle upper class of the Christian community, of the Sunni community. It wasn't the Shia community that got, you know, there is obviously a, a, a working class neighborhood, uh, al Khandaq al Ghamir here, that got damaged too, but it didn't really affect the livelihood in general of the Shia community who who immediately, you know, provided even support to the, the Khandaq al ghamiq and, and Hezbollah did all of its work and so forth. So what did they do? They weakened their their clients, the Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the Western field power with this explosion and with this, uh, you know, uh, threatening behavior and speech in colonial language, you know, wording that they did with this aid, uh, that's supposed to come to Lebanon, they actually 
exposed themselves even more and their tools were exposed even more. So I think, uh, although there is tragedy in Lebanon and uh, a huge amount of the population right now is living under the poverty line, uh, you know, 50 percent uh, at least are impoverished right now, the country may come out of this stronger. And uh, I think the opening with the borders to Syria, right? Every every week we're receiving a hundred thousand barrels of free oil products from Iraq that are passing through the border of Iraq and Syria, through the border of Syria and Iraq and, and Lebanon. Sorry, yeah. that is in itself a, a, a destruction, a blowing up of the international sanctions. Uh, so, you know, there is opportunity coming from this tragedy. Well, Absolutely. the thing is that was really interesting for me that I saw after the explosion is that despite the fact that Israel is our enemy, but at some point within its own uh, uh, media, something will come out of the media that would implicate the Zionist entity into something bad that has happened in Lebanon. What was interesting for me on two uh, uh, separate events is the first, uh, when I read uh, more than a week ago, uh, an article on a website called the Israeli Defense, they got uh, interviews with very high ranking positions inside the Lebanese Occupation Forces Army. And they spoke about the Lebanese uh, uh, explosion and they gave out intelligence uh, saying that their um, uh, their vector scale in 70 kilometers away from Beirut between Beirut and Cy Cyprus, they have uh, they have some sort of a, of, um, uh, a department there that uh, is uh, founded to uh, watch for earthquakes and, and such. And that that Richter scale uh, uh, recorded six explosions five explosions 11 seconds apart minor ones and then after the fifth one 40 30 seconds later a big big explosion and ah. you had quotations from uh, uh people from the israeli army saying that this is a demolition this is a planned a pre-planned demolition they said that yeah we okay. didn't have even we didn't even start investigating this and what also made this very interesting theory for me is that i asked someone who works at the port and who after work also goes back to the port and uh, has the hobby of fishing. He's a very uh, uh, connected relative. Um, he's really close uh, to my family. We were having a discussion last week about uh, how easy it is to actually get into the port of Beirut. He told me that he has entered without showing his paperwork more than 12 times into the port. And he's even, and it's after his uh, uh, work working hours. And he told me, look, if the people who implanted this, and he's very sure that it was uh, an implanted bomb because he went there and he saw the, the crater, he didn't even believe that this was only the, the work of uh, chemicals. This was a, a, a detonation. He said that even if you want to, um, to, to talk about people not entering from the real gates, if someone has the capability to come from the waters, they could do whatever they want and no one would even see them. That's how much of... Uh, so who's, who's in charge of the port? Of, like these, the, the, in, the port officials, area. maybe Leith knows the answer to this. The port officials, you know, they, they're, they're in charge of this vital piece of infrastructure for Lebanon, but they're not, they're not checking passes. They have no basic security. Who's in charge of this? Like, is it a political it, faction? Is it just a business club? The man club? told me that the people, the, he, he told me that the people responsible to check the passes were from the Lebanese army. They used to, at, most of the time, they used to fall asleep at the gate. They have nothing to do. Yani, sadly, three of them passed away in the explosion. One of them was actually sleeping in his room. The wall fall, fell on him. And two of them were killed outside because of the explosion. Yani, three of the people who were supposed to be checking who was entering actually were killed by uh, the explosion. So it's it's also a matter of uh, actual moral corruption by being someone who's too lazy to check uh, on people. I'm not saying they are actually infiltrated or they are part of this uh, game. It might be the case, but maybe not at the level of the real uh, small uh, soldiers. Maybe it's at, at a larger yep. level. Gotcha. Hence, gives us the question why the managers of the port allowed the civil defense to enter while they knew what was inside of Port 12. This is what breaks our hearts the most, that 
you allowed 12 human beings who put their lives on the line to put out the fire while knowing that port 12 has ammonium nitrate and while not giving them the keys to open that port, they were trying to open it uh, a way that, and it, while talking, this gave me goosebumps because you sent these people to die when you had two hours to actually tell the people to get out of the port, you had the military uh, uh, officials and the intelligence officials in the port to, to uh, put them at both ends of the highway in Beirut to stop the traffic. This would have at least uh, 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 decreased the number of fatalities, but they chose to just shut up and sit so at home. And let just, to be, life. just to be clear, uh, you know, Hezbollah has nothing to do with the port. Uh, it's, Absolutely you know, nothing. You know, it, it, it's in a predominantly Christian and Sunni East Beirut, part yeah. of the city. It's right on the highway, so it's all visible for any, you know, intelligence services. So Hezbollah never used this sport, has said so multiple times, even, you know, a year ago when Netanyahu was threatening to bomb the port and claiming that Hezbollah uses it. You know, uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah in his speech at the time, you know, openly said that they don't use any of the ports, that they have their own ways and they have their own supply routes. Um, and so that's very clear. The other thing is that the, you know, those who control actually the port are both the uh, future party and the Kata'ib, okay? which has their main house right there at the port, main, main uh, office of uh, yeah. for their party. So, so why would Hezbollah trust them? Like, <laughs> exactly. No way. Yeah. <laughs> no way. I mean, like, this is the most, most in, you know, intelligent, secure resistance organization in the world. It will not expose itself to such a stupid I mean, act. You know what? If people just read the news, they would actually understand what happened throughout the 10 years of war in Syria and how many times remote areas in the Bekaa Valley were bombed by Israel, which were supposedly weapon warehouses for Hezbollah. But Hezbollah never actually uh, gave an answer whether it was that or not. But the people know that in very far places, non-residential places, they might have been warehouses for weapons for the resistance. More than six times throughout the war on Syria, Israel Israel get, got its jets and bombed these areas. You think for a second if Israel really has an idea that in residential areas here in Dahye, that if there were warehouses, they wouldn't have bombed it. They don't care about us. They carpet bombed us in 2006. They would do it all over again. They don't care. But we, the people who live here, who go out every day, who know every corner in this neighborhood and other neighborhoods in Dahye, that we know that there are no warehouses here. We, Annie, it's, it doesn't take... A, a genius to know where actually Hezbollah has departments for social security, for health, for uh, public relations, or for even schooling, for education. They, they do have a lot of uh, institutions spread around all of Dahye, but we know that we go there. We use the facilities as well. We get treated for mm -hmm. our health at those facilities as well. We know how can they lie to, the, to our faces and then threaten us. Netanyahu has the audacity to threaten us that at any point Israel will try to save the Lebanese people by bombing residential areas where Israel thinks that there is warehouses mm. for uh, the resistance weapons. How I think can Tim wants to can, say can something. I ask a question of, of yeah. Leith? Leith, um, you mentioned I think before that there was, uh, contrary to what the U.S. has been trying to impose, a breach in the blockade with oil coming through from Iraq. Now, could you expand on that a little bit and say, is this actually a, a significant breach in the blockade? Yes. I mean, you know, miraculously, by the night of the explosion in the port, uh, the electricity in Beirut was back to 20 hours a day. We were down, you know, the day before the explosion, we were down to around maybe six hours a day of electricity in Beirut. Uh, everybody was running their diesel generators. So this is even before the, the Iraqi oil, free oil supply started arriving. And so it tells you a lot about how, you know, even the electricity grid is not in, controlled by the government, right? Like there is corrupt officials who were told to starve the population of electricity to make li life miserable in the middle of the summer heat 
uh, to cause more and more agitation against the government. And miraculously, uh, after the explosion, we're right now running 20 hours a day of, of city electricity, government electricity. And so, uh, you know, the blockade on, on Lebanon, between Lebanon and Syria, the, the closure of the border caused by the American sanctions and, and uh, the Caesars Act and the Corona has now been lifted. You know, uh, Iraq mm. has already delivered not only 100,000 barrels of uh, oil products a week, so now it's now three shipments have arrived since the explosion, uh, but also have been sending wheat. Uh, you know, the, the silos in the port were decimated. That's like where 75% of Lebanon's uh, reserve of wheat uh, uh, is. And luckily for the people of Lebanon, Iraq this year, for the first time since 2003, since the invasion and occupation by the United States, it registered its first ever surplus of wheat. And the country was ready to sell it and to make on the international market to make money. Mm -hmm. And they weren't, they haven't sold it yet. And this explosion happened. And now they are donating their, their whole surplus of wheat to Lebanon. So Iraq actually has been right now the most brotherly, most, uh, you know, supportive country to the Lebanese people since this... Uh, Mind you, what, what did the French, the U.S. and Britain bring us? Absolutely, what did they help us with? Yeah, capital flight, they took money out of your country. So all of your <laughs> friends are in the East, and all of yeah, your... Yeah, that, that money was too heavy the on the countries that are, <laughs> that are ripping you off are in the West. Jay, you cannot believe it if you if you just understand the amount of people ready to help from Syria, who I've been contacted with scores of my friends uh, from Syria saying that we need to help. How can we help? We, we even want to donate blood. But because of the coronavirus pandemic, the borders were closed and we were not able to get uh, those. But I did contact the civil defense headquarters in Lebanon and they promised to help. And I even contacted the border uh, uh, management and they told us that for this reason, uh, they're, they're going to open the border for some time for, for help to come from Syria. Even Syria, when it's at its baddest situation, the worst situation, they are still standing by Lebanon and helping the Lebanese. It's good Just to, to hear. Final, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Leith. The final, uh, you know, nobody's talking about this, but at least a thousand of the four thousand, five thousand injured in uh, in Beirut are being treated in Syrian hospitals. Uh, Syria created a caravan of ambulances that rushed from Damascus to Beirut, carried a thousand of those injured to the hospitals in in Damascus, and are being treated for free. Another thing is that uh, at, at least 30% of those who perished in this tragic event are okay. Syrian. You know? um, and at least a third of those who are injured are also Syrian. And, you know, so with all the racism, with all the imperialist plots against the, the brotherhood between Syria and Lebanon, uh, that has not been affected. And people in, in Damascus have felt in their hearts, just like in 2006, uh, you know, when they opened their homes to Lebanese people escaping the war, uh, they're ready to give the little they have to their brothers. Inspirational. Any final thoughts, uh, Marwa? Well, it's just, uh, I think that the Lebanese government is now supposedly going to be formed with a unity government, which means we are back to square one. But this is the only form of government that is viable at this time, because any other form of government will be treated the same way Hassan Diab's government was treated. I am not hopeful as a Lebanese citizen, but I am uh, I'm feeling safe for the first time. Uh, since uh, the October 17th revolution, I'm being the safest right now from any Israeli aggression against my country. But at the same time, I look forward to real and vital uh, anti-corruption movements within the uh, Lebanese uh, government and the Lebanese members of parliament. Because look, sooner or later, the elections are coming and people for the first time are not happy. Okay. Well, uh, that was a really uh, interesting, intense discussion. We covered a lot of ground. We covered a lot of history. I thank you so much, Laith Maruf. Thank you so much, Marwa Usman, 
for, for coming on with us today. We wish you the absolute best and I hope for a prosperous multipolar world in which Lebanon returns to its rightful place. Peace and victory. Thank you so Thank much, Leila. Thank you. Thank you.